this evening. And um, for those of you who don't know the history, Empower You is the brainchild of Dan Reginald. Um, we started quite a few years ago and we've been growing since then. And then Dan built this beautiful studio so we don't have to take our show on the road all the time. And we're a strictly volunteer organization and we work off of um, donations. So any donation is really appreciated. And we always are looking for ideas. If anyone here has an idea, we've gotten some ideas, like from Georgia had an idea about a class. We'll be glad to entertain them. And that's how we get a lot of our good speakers, actually, from people's ideas. And feel free to give us any comments on any classes you have. We welcome any feedback. So I think that's about it. And I will introduce Dan Regener, who is the founder of Empower You and the managing board member. Dan? Glad you could join us tonight. I'm, I'm actually um, very interested in this class because it's something I don't know anything about. And it's just kind of fun to learn new things. So thank you to our speakers for coming tonight. We've got a little door prize we're going to give away. Would you be glad to be willing to draw a ticket? for us. If you've got your tickets, your lucky tickets, the last three numbers on these are 7, 47. You? Oh, you missed it by one. Who's got 747? 747. Uh-oh. We might have to draw another one. Okay, you only get one. Okay, how about 764? <laughs> right here. Okay, and your name is? Paul Cruz. Okay, so this was as close to an invasive species t-shirt as uh, we could we could, uh, we could find. This is from our friends at V&V, &V, which is a uh, disabled art studio right through those doors. We're about 65 disabled artists, so we come and create art. And um, this is a T-shirt from them, and it, it's large. And if you want any other size, we've got it. We can, you can trade it in. So let's give our winner a congratulations. Sure. Um, so we've got um, a couple classes we wanted to tell you about, including um, a class tomorrow night, which I think is going to be a great class on bias in the media with Peter Batea, who um, at least until today was the executive editor of the Enquirer. I'm not sure he is anymore. Uh, uh, I know they named a new editor today at the Enquirer. Um, I think Peter is still there from what I can tell, but maybe in a little different capacity. But he's going to come and talk to us about a study we did last semester on bias in the media and our results. And it should be really interesting. If you can't come from Delhi, you can join us online tomorrow night and kind of see that. And starting the class off tomorrow night is a really interesting guy. It doesn't really have anything to do with Peter, but his name is Brian Shrive. He's an attorney. And he just filed suit against the city of Milford and just won a settlement because it was found that Milford uh, was having closed door meetings and was trying to keep information from the public. It's a really interesting case. Brian's going to talk to us about it for the first 10 minutes of tomorrow night. And then uh, Peter will be on the rest of the time. So I hope you can join us tomorrow night. Then we don't have a class for the rest of the week until next Wednesday when we've got a great one, social media uh, in the workplace. So for all of you who don't really know everything you need to know about Facebook, Twitter, social media, that will be a great session, which will be next Wednesday night from 6 to 7.30. There's a time change on that. And then on May 2nd, we have a very... We've got just one of our most popular speakers, Dr. Jay Rissover, who's talked to us about um, 10 ways to, uh, to ten, the 10 things you need to be most worried about your health. And a couple of the sessions are going to talk about weight control and really what you need to do to get ready for that summer beach season. Um, and then on May 4th, this is just going to be a fantastic class. I wanted to entitle it The Beautiful Life of Justice Antolin Scalia. And this will be kind of a life story of uh, Justice Scalia and some of his great decisions he had before he passed away. So that will be a great session on May 4th. I hope you can join it, join us for that. So uh, what I wanted to do was give a round to Nita Thomas, who's our executive director. And, um, 
Andy Scarth, who's our producer back there. Let's give him a round of applause. And I want to inter introduce you to Amy Sander, who's the operations manager of Empower You. Amy. Good evening. Glad y'all could join us this evening. Um, I've got the pleasure of introducing our speakers this evening. We actually have two of them here, both of which are from the Cincinnati Museum Center. And uh, the first one I'd like to introduce is Heather, and she's the zoology cur curator. <laughs> she's waving. Um, she is a geneticist by training and earned her PhD in biology at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, she has a broad background, including everything from salamanders and fish to Galapagos finches. I'm not even sure if I'm saying Galapagos finches. Um, her work focuses on using genetics to answer questions about how animals populate. Uh, she's particularly interested in the genetics of small populations, which is exactly how invasive speci species start off. Heather has worked with several invasi invasive species, including Asian carp in the Mississippi River watershed and the spotted lanternfly in eastern Pennsylvania. Our other this speaker, speaker this evening is Emily Imhoff. And she uh, is also with the Cincinnati Museum Center as the collections manager, and she's been there since 2015. She grew up in the forests of Hocking Hills, Ohio, and learned all about the local wildflowers, trees, and animals from her biologist parents. An ecologist and astecologist, <laughs> uh, which is one who studies crayfish. Uh, she's been studying crayfish invasions in Ohio, Missouri, and the United Kingdom, which is where she earned her PhD. Emily is passionate about the invasive plant eradication and enjoys plotting the demise of bush honeysuckle and garlic mustard in her spare time. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Heather and Emily. Hello, everybody. Oh, wow, that's loud. Okay. Um, I'm going to start us off very briefly, just telling you a little bit about um, who we are. Um, Amy did a fine introduction explaining that we are from the zoology department. So even though the Union Terminal Center is under construction and the Natural History Museum and History Museum are currently closed because of renovations, the museum is alive and well, it's very active, there's still research going on, mm -hmm. there's still stuff going on in the collections. So we actually are in charge of all of these different collections at the museum. The, we have the mammals, the birds, the reptiles, amphibians, invertebrates, including, including our malacology collection, which is our shell collection, and entomology, which is our bugs. But we also have live animals as well that we use for educational programming, and we have on the exhibit floor. So we're in charge of a lot of different collections at the museum, and we're continuing on behind the scenes, even though we've been displaced temporarily from our Union Terminal Hall. So with that, I will let Emily get us started. She's going to give us an introduction on what invasive species are, and she's going to cover some case studies of invasive plants that you might be familiar with. And then I'm going to take over for the animals a little bit later on. And after our talk, we've got some uh, items from the collection and items that we collected on a park on the way here uh, to give you some examples of some of these species that we'll be talking about tonight. So with that, I'll turn it over to Emily. Thank you. OK, hello, everyone. As she said, I'm going to talk about um, invasions in general. And then we'll talk about plants. So you have a handout that has some terminology. We're going to get to that in a minute. But first off, what is an invasive species? So the National Invasive Species Council has a nice definition up there for us. But basically, it's a plant or an animal or a fungus or a disease that moves from the area it naturally occurs to a new area, and then it reproduces and starts causing some harmful effects on either the ecosystem or on human health or the um, economy. Uh, currently, there are about 50,000 species that are non-native in the United States of America. And of those, most of them are considered invasive. So most of them are considered harmful. But not all of them. Some of them come here and don't become invasive. They simply live here in harmony with nature. OK, so there's a few invasions that you might have heard about that have um, a lot of publicity behind them. Um, pythons in the Everglades, has anyone heard about those? They were probably pets that escaped and then just started reproducing in the wilderness of the Everglades. 
Um, so that's pretty well known. Um, in Australia, they have these large toads called cane toads that were brought in to control a, um, a crop pest, but then the toads started taking over. So uh, that's one of them right there, eating another cane toad. Um, let's see, rabbits are also are non-native to Australia and have been having some negative effects there. Um, if anyone's gone to Florida, you might have seen kudzu vines smothering the forest like a green wall. Uh, so that's pretty well known. And then finally, lionfish is a uh, kind of gaining notoriety off the coast of Florida. They're um, harming the native ecosystem in the ocean there. So now we'll do some terms here other than invasive species. So what is a native species? That is an animal or a plant that naturally occurs in an area. So before anyone was planting things, it lived there. Um, here on the map is just an example of a crayfish, because that's what I like. <laughs> so here it's showing the native range of the rusty crayfish. So you can see there's us. So it naturally occurs here in our area. Um, so that's its native range, the territory that the species lives in in a natural setting. So then an introduced species, that's like what I mentioned earlier, where not all of the invasive or not all of the species that come here actually become invasive. Um, think about daffodils. Lots of people have planted daffodils and you see them in yards, but you don't see them just taking over the entire territory, right? Um, so that would be considered an introduced species that has not become invasive. Also, most of our crops are like that. Think of corn, soybeans. They stay in the fields where they're planted for the most part. So they're not considered invasive. Okay, so then an invasive species, we have the definition already. Um, and here is the invasive range of this crayfish. So if we found a rusty crayfish here, we'd say, oh, it's a native species. It belongs here. But if we found a native, or if we found a rusty crayfish up in Wisconsin or Minnesota, it would be considered an invasive species there because it doesn't belong. Um, so yeah, many introduced species do not become invasive, and a native species can sometimes be considered invasive, not technically, but sometimes it can start to act like an invasive species. And uh, the rusty crayfish is an example of that. We're going to get to it a little later. Okay, so in the title, we called it the invasion of the resource snatchers. So what is a resource? That is anything that an organism needs to live. So resources that we use, for example, food, housing, things like that. So for uh, plants, sunlight, they need water, they need space to grow in the soil, um, and nutrients. So those are the big resources plants need, and they're gonna compete with other plants to get those things. Then animals mostly just need food and space. Usually water isn't limiting for animals because they're able to travel to water. Uh, finally, of course, animals do compete for mates, but usually within the same species, usually. Um, so organisms that are less specific in their resource needs are considered more adaptable, and they're probably more likely to become invasive. Um, so if it's an animal like a raccoon that can eat all kinds of foods, it's going to be able to live in different areas with different food availability. But if it's an animal that can only eat one specific plant, if that plant becomes scarce, then the animal species will also become scarce. So if you're um, an adaptable organism, you're more likely to succeed as an invasive species. Okay, so the process of invasion. First, the um, individuals, some number of individuals, are going to arrive in the new habitat. So that's considered the arrival phase. Then you have the establishment phase. Those individuals that have arrived um, are able to use the resources and they start growing and thriving and they start reproducing in the area. And then there can often be a lag time where that population is getting bigger and bigger but it's not really spreading, it's just getting more dense. And then suddenly some tipping point is reached, and this can vary quite a bit in the amount of time it takes, and they start spilling out and becoming invasive and spreading. Okay, so the arrival phase. How do they get here? There are lots of different ways they can get here, and these are called vectors. That's one of our terms. 
vector or pathway. So that is how the organism is moved there. And usually it's moved by people or by another organism. Um, so it can be brought intentionally. So if a plant is imported from another country, it's brought here, people think it looks pretty, so they plant it in the garden, and then it escapes from the garden. Maybe birds eat the seeds and carry them somewhere else, um, or they just start spreading beyond the garden. Um, a lot of aquatic species were stocked intentionally, like fish. They were brought over thinking they would be beneficial, but then they started spreading out of control and became a problem. So uh, that's a significant source of invasions there. Um, some of them are planted for agricultural purposes, so erosion control, food for livestock, um, fence rows like a hedgerow to separate pastures. And then sometimes they are released to control other species. So like the cane toad was imported to Australia to control these crop pests, larvae that were eating um, their crops. So they brought in the cane toad to eat those pests, but then the cane toads themselves became a pest. So that's called biological control. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, okay, also they can be accidentally imported. Um, and for the Great Lakes region, that's not really us, but we're in Ohio, we touch the Great Lakes, we count. Um, cargo shipments and ballast water of ships can be a big source. So you're a ship and you're over in Russia or Asia and you need to get some ballast water, so you pull in this water from the environment there and it could have organisms in it. It could have diseases, it could have tiny organisms in it. And then you cross the ocean and you get to your dock here in the Great Lakes or wherever you're going and you dump the ballast water out. And then all of those organisms that survived the trip are then released into the environment. So that can be a problem. And then in cargo shipments, uh, containers are built from a lot of times wood, like a wooden packing crate and there could be insects in there, and then they're moved in the cargo. Um, finally, on imported plants, that is common for insects if they're in the plant, or maybe um, another plant seeds are in the soil that the plant is moved in, and then it uh, escapes once it arrives here. And then, of course, like the pythons, release or escape pets, or zoo animals, or bait. So here's a bait bucket introduction. Uh, you go fishing, you have a bunch of minnows or crayfish left at the end, and you just think, oh, I will set them free, which is a nice idea, but they could become invasive. So we encourage people to not ever release any animal unless you captured it in the same location. Okay. There we go. All right, so what makes an invasion successful? What lets them get started and actually start taking over? Um, the main thing is propagule pressure, and that's at the arrival stage where they're coming in. And that means how many propagules are there, how many individuals. So if you have one crayfish introduced into a lake, it's probably not going to be able to form an invasive population. It probably won't find a mate, even if, if there are even just two, you know, they might not find each other. So it's less likely to be able to reproduce and survive. But if you dump in a bucket of 150 crayfish, they're more likely to be able to find mates within the population and then start expanding. So propagule pressure is just the number of individuals that are um, introduced. Okay, and then I crammed all the other ones on the slide. Um, some things that make a species better at being invasive if it can live in a disturbed habitat or an urban area, which is basically an area where humans are, are moving around and using the land and changing the, the soil maybe, um, or the habitat, if they can live in that, they're more likely to become invasive. Also, adaptability, that kind of goes along with it. We talked about um, resources. If they can use all different resources, they're more likely to become invasive. Okay. Um, Reproduction, if they have lots of young very quickly, they're more likely to be able to um, establish a good sized population and then start spreading. Okay, um, reproduction, this is especially important for plants, but it can also um, be valid for animals. And that is if they start growing earlier in the season. Um, if it's a bush or a plant that grows over the ground, 
if it grows early in the season and starts putting out its leaves, it can shade out the native species that start sprouting later, and they won't get enough of that sunlight resource that they need. So that's a big one for plants. Um, it does apply to some animals too. Okay, if they're aggressive, so if they, are, if, this obviously doesn't apply to plants, but if they are aggressive behavior-wise, they may be able to push out the native species that they would be competing with. And then last is disease or parasite resistance. So if you are bringing a plant from, say, southern Asia and you bring it here, the disease that it was exposed to in southern Asia probably aren't here. It may not be susceptible to many of the diseases we have and it's able to flourish, whereas our native species may still be susceptible to the diseases, of course, that they grew up with. Okay, so about the animals that um, are adaptable and live around humans, this is kind of a subset of the invaders, and Heather's going to talk about them more because it's mostly the animals, but uh, these are species that live really close to humans, possibly even in our houses, right by our houses, and really close um, with us. So these guys have lived with humans for hundreds of years, and they're very well adapted to living alongside of us. Um, some of these are animals, a lot of birds, got pigeons, house sparrows, you're probably familiar with them, they live very close to people, rats, and cats. Okay, so why do we care about invasive species? Why can't we just let them take over? I mean, it's easy to just not do anything, right? Of course. But um, they have some negative effects here. So they can cause native species to become endangered. Um, you know, the endangered species um, can be threatened by them. They also cause a loss of biodiversity and a loss of the natural resources that our species need to be able to survive and thrive. So biodiversity is kind of the number of different species living in an area. And usually um, a healthy area, a healthy forest, which is what we have here, is going to have a big variety of species, lots of different wildflowers, trees, mammals, birds, all in one area. But when an invasive species enters the area, it's going to remove a lot of those species and you'll have much less biodiversity. So there's less variety of resources available. Also, invasive species can cause a lot of property damage, um, especially things like zebra mussels, which physically damage things. Um, or you've got the emerald ash borer, which kills trees, which can then, of course, fall onto people's houses. And then they also reduce property value just by being unpleasant to look at and loss of native wildflowers, things like that. They just make the area less desirable. Finally, oh, not finally, we've got two more. They are very expensive to control. We spend over a billion dollars every year in the country just trying to remove them from areas, either for purposes of biodiversity, or in the case of zebra mussels, just to keep our industries able to operate in watery areas. Okay, and last of all, they can sometimes transmit diseases to people or to our native species or our livestock. So that is a concern from the health standpoint. All right, so we talked about the species themselves. What about the ecosystem? How can we prevent our ecosystems from being invaded? Um, there's a couple of different areas. First, at the introduction stage, you need to think about what are the vectors in this habitat? How can invasive species arrive in my yard, in the park down the street? Um, they can come on people's shoes with seeds. Maybe birds are coming into the area and dropping seeds. Let's get started. Um, Things like that. Okay, so for habitat, the disturbance of the area is going to affect its ability to be invaded. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more um, in the next slide. Also, the similarity of the habitat to um, the invader's native habitat is going to have an impact. So we're not likely to have an invasive species from sub-Saharan Africa be able to live in Ohio because it's a totally different environment than what it's used to. We're not likely to have an arctic species come to Ohio and invade because it's a very different habitat. So the more similar the habitats, the more likely it's going to be able to invade. So we get a lot of invasive species from Asia and kind of the middle part of Asia and then also Europe. Okay, last, the native community. 
So if the native community in that habitat is in good shape, if it's very untouched and natural, it's going to be better able to withstand an invasion and try to keep those plants and animals from taking over. This doesn't always work, but it can help. So is the native community in its natural, diverse state? Are there already lots of animals and plants living there, using the resources? Uh, a niche is um, a part of the ecosystem that the animal lives, like maybe what it feeds off of, kind of its job, you could call it. So if all the jobs are taken in the ecosystem, then there's nothing for the invader to, to take. Finally, um, enemies. Are there some predators around that could maybe start eating the invaders? That's always a good thing. That could be plants or animals that are getting eaten. OK, so I mentioned disturbance. So what is the disturbance of a habitat? Um, these can be natural or human-caused disturbances. It's basically anything that changes the ecosystem significantly. So a natural disturbance could be something like a fire. Um, there's a picture here of a forest fire aftermath there. Um, you can see it's very muddy. Nothing is still growing. Uh, some muddy water there. So it looks, looks bad, right? So that could be invaded by um, an outside species because there's nothing there to compete with it, at least for now. So that can be caused by um, fires. It could be caused by a large storm event um, or severe flooding. There's also human-caused disturbances that are just the result of human activities, uh, pollution or excess sediment in the water. That's going to be a disturbance. Um, agriculture or construction projects is a kind of disturbance. And then removal of native vegetation for whatever reason. Um, so here we have a forest, and it's been cleared here. So that is now ripe for being invaded by something. OK, so how can we prevent these troublesome events from taking place? First, we want to reduce the possible vectors. And there's two ways to do that. That's regulations and public outreach and education. So here's an example of public outreach. This is a sticker that is provided um, by the Great Lakes and bait shops um, and anywhere you buy your um, boating licenses and things. It says, bait and non-native plants and animals hitchhiking in bait can harm our lakes and rivers. Don't dump bait. Dispose of bait in the trash. So that's just letting people know that it can be harmful and what you can do to prevent it. So that's um, public outreach there. And there are a lot of programs in the Great Lakes area, especially for this. Um, we don't have so much down here, unfortunately. And then regulations, um, things like rules about where ships can dump their ballast water, whether they need to sterilize it first somehow before they dump it, things like that. OK, so what else can we do? We can improve and protect our native habitats. So assess the native community that's in the area. Is it healthy? Um, are all of the plants that you would expect to be there growing? Are there some spaces that look empty? Um, and then we can also try to mitigate any disturbances we do. So if we have a construction project, afterwards, people will usually immediately plant plants. And that is um, an example here. This was uh, disturbed here by this construction. And then afterwards, they planted all these native wetland grasses and uh, forbs around it so that it has a natural community. That way, it's harder for an invasive species to come in and start growing. OK, so a uh, little last thing here before we get into the plants. Um, the native invaders. So the rusty crayfish is native here, but something has changed in our ecosystem that has given it a foot up over the other crayfish. Um, when a native becomes invasive and acts like an invasive, usually something has changed in the habitat that makes it suddenly have um, an advantage over the other species present. So these guys like to eat algae. And historically, our area has had a small to moderate amount of algae in the waters. Um, and they lived alongside of another crayfish that was more omnivorous. But uh, now, with increased nutrients entering the water, more algae is growing, which would be fine, except these guys are going to town on it. And there's so many of them that they are able to um, push out the other native species, which is now an imperiled species in the state of Ohio. So there's an example of endangerment right there. Um, but they are technically 
native here. So it's a confusing situation to deal with. Eastern coyotes are another example. Um, there's lots of coyotes around here. You can hear them out at night, probably howling sometimes, depending on where you're located. Um, but historically, there would have been many more wolves in the area. However, um, as the European colonists moved west, we pushed all the wolves out or killed them. So the coyotes began to move into the area more. Historically, there were very few coyotes in this area, almost none. But as the wolves left, the coyotes started moving in. So technically they're native here, but they, they used to not occur in these numbers. Okay, so the conclusion of the introduction section here. Um, critic introduction is the most important part to control invasions. Once an invasion starts, it's very, very difficult to stop it, especially aquatic invasions. Um, environmental harm is caused by them, as well as economic harm. And you can reduce the harm they are causing by physically removing them. This is usually useful in the case of plants where they can't run away, they can't escape, they're easy to see. You can rip them out of the ground. Um, so you can remove them and allow the native plants to come back. For animals, it's a little harder, especially birds and fish, but we can try. Okay, so we should all do our part to control the invasive species. Now we're going to switch over and talk about plants. Are there any questions first on that first section? Yes? Yeah, it has fluctuated a bit. Um, they started moving back into the area, and then it took a while for them to really adapt to living around humans, and now they're starting to get more adapted to being around humans, so they are starting to populate more. Um, no, they just didn't occur here before, so they're just increasing. Oh, sorry. Okay, now it's on. So just raise your hand and I'll bring the mic to you, okay? Thank you. Okay, any other questions? We could turn the microphone if you have just a Just a second. Who has a question? Anyone? Yes? Don't some invasive species kind of increase the thickness? And like, for instance, we long as you and you see a lot of increase in black bears. Yes, yes. So he asked if some invasive species can increase the prey base. Yes, they, there would then be more prey, theoretically. Um, of course, you have to remember that it is a food web, and if they're increasing the prey base, that must be meaning they're eating more things that the other native species can't eat, because that biomass has to come from somewhere. So if you were managing a property for a species that needed to eat prey, you could allow the invasive species to remain and see how it turned out. This is a complicated web, the web of life. That's a good question. Okay, anything else? We'll move on to plants. Okay, so here are some of our common local plant invaders that I'm going to be talking about. Maybe you guys recognize some of these. I bet you know bush honeysuckle. Mm-hmm, Callaway pear. Or calorie pear, and those are pretty common. Okay, so bush honeysuckle is probably the number one invader in this area. I would hazard a guess. This is the thing that you see turning green before anything else in the springtime. About a month ago, if you drive down the highway, you see these green bushes about yay big along it. Those are all the bush honeysuckles. They turn green way before our native shrubs and bushes. And that is one of their um, advantages, is that they are able to get the sunlight earlier than the native species. So if you go to an area with a lot of bush honeysuckle, the understory is usually, there's usually not much down there because they shade everything out so early. So these guys were brought here from Europe and Asia, and they were originally used for a couple of things. Their main thing was controlling erosion, but they were also planted as an ornamental. Um, occasionally, but the, uh, when you're planting hundreds of them to control erosion, it's going to have more of an impact than one person planting one in their yard, right? Of course. So they got out of control, they spread way beyond where they were supposed to be, and now we have them all over the Midwest. So the problems with these guys, mostly they form a monoculture, which is where it's just nothing but bush honeysuckle. 
especially in the understory of a forest near the edge, they get lots of sunlight, and it's just bush honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle. Maybe a few things growing around them, but it's rare. So they outcompete the native plants, which is unfortunate because it's bad for the wildlife. Their berries that they produce aren't as good of quality of berries as some of the native shrubs produce. And also, studies have found that birds nesting in these bushes have a lower success rate than in some of the native bushes. I'm not sure why that is, but that's what they found. Um, so um, the question about the prey base actually is relevant here, because although their berries are not as nutritional, they are producing them in huge numbers. So maybe a balance is out. It depends how many berries the birds can eat, I suppose. But uh, here's some nice images of what they look like. A lot of times they have this characteristic kind of bend to the stems. And then sometimes the younger stems will appear straight out of there. They have this appearance here, the um, opposite leaves with the little flower buds coming off at that same location. And we have some examples of them and most of the other plants back there. Please feel free to look at them at the end. Okay, calorie pear is another one we have a lot of in this area. And just like the bush honeysuckle, you're going to see them earlier in the year than anything else. So right now we have dogwoods blooming. These guys have already finished blooming. So they look like a white, usually they have a kind of fattened cone shape, but they can be rounded or fairly straight too. Um, they are planted ornamentally, and they have a really interesting story. They were brought here very carefully. They were different cultivars, which is like different types of the same species, and scientists tested them to see if they could reproduce. And they had developed this variety that wasn't supposed to be able to reproduce. So they thought, great, we'll, we'll send these, we'll plant them, they're beautiful, they have these nice flowers early in the year. Perfect, they won't reproduce, so stay where we put them. But the problem is they brought in multiple cultivars, and though although they could not breed with themselves, they were able to hybridize. So scientists were thwarted, and uh, the plants started hybridizing. They formed these um, mystery hybrids, and they are able to reproduce quite well, as you can see if you drive around slightly after the bush honeysuckles start to green up. You see these guys, and uh, you'll see them in people's yards um, where they were planted ornamentally before they escaped and started hybridizing. But the, the hybrids you'll see out um, along highways, just where, wherever there's land that they can grow on without anyone bothering them. And they usually look pretty much like this in um, early April, late March, around here. So they escaped from ornamental plantings. We tried hard. Everyone tried to not let them become invasive, but it still happened. Um, so the problems with these guys is that they are prone to storm damage. So people who have them too close to the house um, in winter storms, their branches aren't very strong and they're prone to falling off and becoming damaged. They also grow rapidly because of their early start in the season compared to the native plants. And they can also form a monoculture just like the bush honeysuckle. We haven't had them as long as the bush honeysuckle, so we haven't seen a whole lot of that. Um, over by Westchester, they have a couple of areas that are getting pretty thick with these guys. So, um, And they also produce an unpleasant smell. So that doesn't really have to do with them being invasive, but um, it's a little downside if you have a whole bunch of them growing wild near your house. OK, garlic mustard. Is anyone familiar with this? Yeah? This just a second, please. Oh, it wasn't a question. I was just asking if anyone knew it. Um, so this guy was imported in the 1800s, and it was brought over specifically to be an herb, both as a flavoring, hence garlic mustard, those are both delicious flavorings, and as a medicinal herb. So it was brought over intentionally and planted. It wasn't intended to become invasive, of course. People just wanted to be able to enjoy it. Um, so it was native to Europe and Asia, and also northern Africa. But, of course, it escaped and started growing wild. Um, like the bush honeysuckle, it is able to dominate even in a forest. It gets going kind of early. Right now it's already blooming, although we have a lot of native wildflowers blooming now. But this guy has another thing up his sleeve that the native species don't have. What is this word? That is allelochemicals. And this is a chemical compound that the plants can produce that 
does something to benefit them. So when we eat herbs and they taste good, we're tasting the allelochemicals, which are designed usually to prevent things from eating them, but we like them. Um, so in this case, they have these chemicals that actually suppress mycorrhizal fungi, which is a fungus that grows in symbiosis with native plant roots. So this fungus is helping the native plants to get nutrients and be able to grow um, healthily, but the garlic mustard produce these chemicals that suppress those fungi, and they don't need them to grow. So it's a benefit to them because if you have enough garlic mustard in an area, the other plants will start to be unable to compete as well. Also, so since they form a, a dominant culture down there, they're going to reduce the native biodiversity. Um, if you go to an area where all the garlic mustard has been removed, they'll usually be beautiful wildflowers, but then the garlic mustard, if it comes back, it'll start smothering them again. Also, a problem is that deer don't prefer to eat these. They can eat them, they sometimes nibble on them, but they don't prefer them. So the deer are going to pre prefer to eat the native plants, so now the native plants have nothing going for them. They've got the garlic mustard coming up early, they've got the allelochemicals making it harder for them to get nutrients, and now the deer are eating them more. So these guys are quite problematic. And we do have examples of that as well back there. Okay, the Japanese honeysuckle, this is a little different from the bush honeysuckles. This is a vine. So in this case, it's grown up on this little tree, and this is all the vine up here that's got the, uh, the leaves and the flowers. So, as you can see, it kind of smothers the tree by growing up there, and then it puts out all of its leaves over the tree's leaves, so the tree can't get as much sunlight. And also, they can physically pull down or disfigure a tree just with the weight of all of their leaves and branches. These guys were also from Asia, and they were brought as an ornamental. They're very pretty. They have these lovely flowers, and they smell great. But they escaped, and now they are out there causing trouble. These guys are not as troublesome around here as the bush honeysuckles, but we do have them. If you look around, you can find some. So yeah, they grow over and smother the native plants, and they can form these really dense mats where nothing can, nothing else can use the land. Okay, multiflora rose. Oh no, we're going to go back. Can we go back one slide? The back button isn't really. Oh, there it is. I get it. Okay, so multiflora rose, uh, this is really common in southeast Ohio. We do have it here as well, but um, it's almost like we've traded the bush honeysuckle for the multiflora rose, where in southeast Ohio is more of the rose, we have more of the honeysuckle. But these guys are kind of similar in that they're a shrub-like plant. The rose is a little bit bigger than this. This is as tall as I am. Um, but uh, they're also from Asia. You notice the theme here. And they were also imported for um, kind of land usage, not so much ornamental um, erosion control, and also fence rows. So it was advertised as a way for farmers to keep their cows in one area. And uh, it escaped, and it actually is a problem for pastures now because without control, they will just spring up in the pasture, start growing. The cows don't really want to eat them, so they form these really dense thickets. Uh, they can crowd out the native plants, just like all the others. Um, and a negative with them is they produce rose hips, which birds eat a large number of, and then they can spread them. So they're really easily spread by birds. And just like the bush honeysuckle, the birds that nest in these bushes have less success than if they nest in the, the native shrubs. So they're not a huge problem around here compared to some of the others, but they are present. Okay, now we've got the English ivy. This you will see around. This is really common in people's yards or growing up the house. Um, it's a nice ornamental. It was brought over for that purpose. It's native to a large area of Europe and Western Asia. And this one forms a monoculture. It'll grow over a very large area of the land. It forms a really dense mat on the ground and it will smother the native plants. Its leaves stay green most of the time, so they are already ready to start photosynthesizing in the spring. And finally, they can pull down trees just like the um, Japanese honeysuckle. I think that's the last of my plants. 
oh no, we've got big buttercup. These guys are kind of new. Um, this is actually a picture of Burnett Woods. Has anyone been to Burnett Woods? It's over by the university. Yeah, it is shocking how much this has taken over. The entire forest floor is one species in this area. So they mostly like gentle slopes or flat areas, and they form a really dense mat of plants. And I have brought some of them as well back there. Uh, these guys are also from Europe and Asia. They were brought as an ornamental. They have a pretty flower. Oh, I didn't get a picture of the flowers. It's like a little buttercup looking flower. It's very nice. But unfortunately, they are very good at forming this monoculture that excludes all of our spring wildflowers that we love to look at, like spring beauties, um, wild geranium. There's nothing here except these. And they also, unfortunately, have a toxin in their juices. And it's toxic if you eat it. You can get, um, depending on how much you eat, you can get very sick. But you can also get a rash from getting it on your skin. So you don't want to walk barefoot through these guys. It can, uh, it can cause a pretty bad rash and nausea and other things. But uh, that's fairly new for our area. And so there's a lot of it in Burnett Woods and some other places. But again, it hasn't quite reached the levels of some of the other invasives we have. Okay, so that's the bit of the plants. Some things that are coming soon, possibly. This is Phragmites. Has anyone been up by northern Ohio? If you go up there, there are these huge mats of this reed. And we actually have a native variety of this. But our native variety doesn't form a huge mat like this. This, nothing else is going to be able to grow in here, and it's using up a lot of land that, that animals, can use, animals can't use because it's just so dense. So uh, that could be coming down here. We don't have a lot of wetlands like they do up there, so it will probably never be as huge of a problem down here. But um, we do have the Ohio River and lots of streams, so we could see it. And then here's the kudzu, which is coming from the south up, and uh, it's been slowly making its way north. It's a vine. It was brought in for feeding livestock and erosion control. And it's also very good at smothering forests. It grows extremely fast. OK, so that's it for the plants. As I said, we've got some examples of some of the plants back there. Um, please feel free to come up and ask questions about them at the end. And then I'm going to turn it over to Heather to do animals. Oh, no, I forgot my control slides. OK, we're going to go through these fast. I've been taking up too much time. I get very excited about them. OK, so ways you can remove invasive plants. If you have a yard, if you live next to a park and want to do your part, how can you remove them? So physical removal, if you don't want to use chemicals, um, for herbaceous plants, that's the little guys, like the garlic mustard, you can just pull them up. You just want to make sure to get the roots with that, or they can come back. Um, so with garlic mustard, you just grasp it right at the bottom and just rip it right out. And then you can also burn the area. This is something. If you're managing like a large area of a prairie or something, you can burn it. Probably not the best thing to try in your backyard. OK, so for woody plants, these are things like the honeysuckle vines, the honeysuckle bushes. You can cut the stump or cut it down at the ground, make a stump, and then immediately paint the stump with an herbicide. This is my little tools up here. So you want to have your herbicide, which you can paint on after you saw through the stump of the honeysuckle. And then I'll get it. And that allows you to apply very little herbicide, just right on the stump. Another way, you can dig them out, but you have to get the roots. You can use something called a, a weed wrench, which you just stick on the bottom and you kind of pry out like a pry bar. But again, you want to make sure to get the roots. OK, chemical removal. Always follow the directions for safe application. Um, you can spray the foliage with a more dilute herbicide when the plant has got all its leaves out. You can spray over um, the leaves. And you can also paint the base of stems, such as the honeysuckle, with special oil-based herbicides that are designed just for that. Um, with these kind of applications, you want to make sure to do it when it's not raining. And make sure to follow any directions. After you remove the invasive, what do you do? Number one thing, make sure to continue to remove them when they try to come back, because they will. Um, you can take the effort to plant some native trees, shrubs, grasses, wildflowers, or you can let them return naturally. Usually, there's a lot of seeds still in the soil, and if you remove the native, uh, remove the invasives, the natives will usually come back. Okay, benefits of removal: return of native plants, such as beautiful wildflowers. 
increased biodiversity, which is great for the birds and things like that. Okay, so here is a park in Cincinnati called Parker Woods. It's got English ivy and bush honeysuckle, and that's it. Down here we have the um, big buttercup us all over Burnett Woods. Okay, here we have Buttercup Valley. If you like wildflowers, you need to go to Buttercup Valley Preserve like right now. There's so many flowers. It's beautiful. We've got um, native poppies, things like that. Here's a buckeye coming up. It's amazing. Here are some of the wildflowers. There we go. So all of these are able to thrive in that same park, just where they move, remove the ivy and the honeysuckle. We've got all of these beautiful flowers, um, native trees coming back. It's lovely. So that is my plug for getting rid of invasive plants. OK, now finally, Heather gets to talk. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> time. Okay. Uh, we'll be speedy through this. Um, so my part is the animal section. So there are lots of, in of uh, invasive animals that we have locally. Some you may have heard of, some are not quite so well known. So some of the invertebrates, the emerald ash borer, I'm going to talk about zebra mussels, um, Asian lady beetles. So anything that we call ladybugs generically, most of them are not native. Most of them are actually introduced and displacing our native ladybugs. Um, the rusty crayfish, Emily talked about. The Asian tiger mosquito, any time you have a new mosquito making an appearance, that's a big concern because mosquitoes are often disease vectors. So any time you get a new mosquito popping up, there's a lot of general health concerns. So what diseases can that mosquito carry? Are they gonna be transmitted to humans, livestock? other animals, so it's a huge concern whenever there's a new mosquito that pops up on the scene. Longhorn beetles we're going to talk about. Gypsy moths were actually introduced in the 1800s because one of the early colonists decided that he wanted to start a silk industry in the U.S. trying to breed gypsy moths for their silk. They escape and they're spreading all over the Northeast now. So gypsy moths are, being, are a big problem now. Uh, stink bugs, you guys are probably seeing these roaming around at this point. So these guys are, um, several species are introduced and they're crop pests as well as annoying if they get in your house and you squish one and they smell really bad. Um, some of the fish we have, all of the carp species or what we call carp here are actually non-native. They've all been introduced. Um, what we consider our native carp are actually suckers, which are a completely different type of fish. Um, snakeheads, have you guys ever seen those? The long, eely looking things with the sharp teeth. They look kind of scary. Um, these guys are on the move. They're spreading around. We don't have them here as far as I know yet, but they could be coming. Um, some herps, the common wall lizard we'll talk about. We mentioned that a little bit earlier. Um, also, lots of birds, we'll talk about some of those, and a few mammals as well. So the emerald ash borer is probably one that you're all familiar with. This is a huge concern because these little guys are ash specialists. So they like to burrow into the living tissue of ash trees, and those trees are eventually killed because of their infestation. And these guys have really spread um, all over the eastern U.S., they're causing a lot of damage with all these ash trees. Um, and if you take out the ash trees in our native forests, you're altering the native community. So by removing a major player in our forests, you're going to get very, very different forest composition. Um, when these guys die and fall or are removed, they're opening gaps in the canopy, which you've ta we've talked about, the early leafing honeysuckle and garlic mustard. They love those disturbances. They love that early sunlight in the spring. So these um, losses of ash trees actually open up those spaces in the forest for these invaders to um, possibly move in. Um, and of course, dead trees are always a nuisance on your property because they could fall on your garage, on your car, on your house. So you have to be very careful and monitor if you have ash trees that might be infested with this borer. What can you do about it? There's a lot of quarantines on moving firewood from counties or states. 
Um, so you need to be super careful. Typically, sort of like where you, um, where Emily mentioned bait fish, if you catch it there, use it there, right? Don't move it around. So if you need firewood, if you're going out camping in one of the um, state parks or something, buy firewood on site or collect it locally and don't move it around. Um, some trees can be protected with insecticides, but this is an ongoing battle to keep your trees safe from this little guy. Um, get rid of dead trees so that they don't damage any property. Um, and if you can't get ash trees to grow, if they keep getting infested, you can always try to uh, supplement other species, other native species on your property. <laughs> uh, the stink bug. Um, so this was, again, native to Asia, imported. Um, these red states are where it's a severe agricultural pest. And the, as you move west, it's getting a little less abundant and less of a problem, but it's spreading. And it is a sap sucker. So these guys actually feed on the fluids of plants. And they damage a lot of crops, including fruits and soybeans. Um, and of course, they get into our house, our houses. Um, and they're not real pleasant to uh, block. Asian longhorn beetles. This is actually a really localized problem. So these guys are from Asia. They were accidentally brought over in cargo. And they're actually in East Fork State Park. They're in Claremont County. But these guys have a very bizarre distribution. Because normally, when you have an invasion, an invader comes in to a particular spot. They establish. You have that lag time that Emily talked about. And then they start to spread. And they just kind of radiate out from their point of introduction. But these guys have this really weird, they're in Massachusetts in a very constricted area. They're in New York in a very small area. They're in Ohio in just one county. And they're also um, on the north shore of Lake Erie in a very concentrated area. So why they're distributed this way, I'm not sure. It's kind of a strange pattern for an invasive. But what the worry is, is that each of these introductions could begin to spread from that central location. And eventually, we could see an infestation all over the north. Yes, sir. I had heard that they cut down a large swath of trees around East Fork to control that. Have they, have they been able, have they discovered that it's expanded beyond that area? I have, I have not heard that. So that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, um, they, it's I mean, they, they literally came in, it was like almost a square mile, and they took down every tree and ground up every single piece of wood. Wow. To kill it. OK. Um, I know it's in East Fork, and I know the Hamilton County parks have advisories and postings in their parks saying, if you see this thing, report it, let them know. Um, so I know there's a lot of concern that this thing is going to spread. So they, it's possible that they went in and said, we've detected yeah, it, we got yeah, it. This is a state. federal one. I mean, the federal government comes in. This isn't a state government. The federal oh, government okay. comes in. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Okay. I'll have to look into that. I hadn't heard that. Um, so, yep. So this is a big concern. If you see this guy around, make sure that you report it to the county parks or state wildlife officials, because they'll definitely want to know if this thing's getting out. Zebra mussels, everybody heard of those? Everybody heard of these guys? So these guys were actually brought over in ballast water. So Emily talked about how when you suck water up into the ship's ballast, you can get all kinds of organisms from the water, microorganisms. You can get larval stages of these types of organisms. You can get small fish, all kinds of things. And those can be released when a ship gets to its destination and drains its ballast. So there's a lot of concern about these guys. They've spread all over the place. They're really hard to contain once they've been established. Uh, so you can see they're all over the Mississippi River watershed. They're all over the Great Lakes. And these guys are really problematic because they will grow on anything. And they clog up water intake pipes, ex um, water outtake pipes. They'll attach to your boat. They'll attach to anything that's in the water that they can anchor to. So these things form these dense mats. They'll cover native mussel beds. So they'll just sit right down on top of our native species and smother them out. So these guys are a really big concern. Um, but one plus, if there could be one, 
for zebra mussels is these guys are filter feeders and they're incredibly efficient filter feeders. So the water in Lake Erie is actually a lot clearer than it used to be because they're eating all of the suspended material out of the Great Lakes. Um, but that's a very minor plus in a long list of negatives for these guys. Um, so they can cause a lot of damage and there's a really big push to try and control how much these guys spread, even though, as Emily mentioned, once these guys establish and spread, it's really difficult to control them. So if you want to try to avoid moving these things around, clean off your boat, make sure you're not transporting any filled water, anything from one body of water to another, try to clean everything out so that you're not transporting the larvae of these guys that are free floating in the water column uh, to other destinations. Uh, Asian carp. Anybody heard of these guys? So you guys have probably seen YouTube videos and TV footage of these things jumping on people when they're in their boats. Um, this is actually my specialty. I spent three years working for the Army Corps of Engineers um, studying these invasive Asian carp in the Mississippi River. So I've had several colleagues get hit with these guys when they're jumping out of the water. I've been fortunate so far. I haven't had any incidents, uh, but my days are numbered, I'm sure. <laughs> so these guys are filter feeders. So just like the zebra mussels, these guys were actually stocked to keep fishery ponds and landscaping ponds clean, so very clear water. And unfortunately, down in the southern states, Arkansas, Mississippi, uh, Louisiana, these guys escaped during floods. So major floods of the Mississippi River washed these guys out into the main river channels. And unfortunately, they really like it here. So they've continued to spread, clear up the Mississippi River. They're all over the Mississippi River watershed. Um, our biggest concern right now is that they're gonna get into the Great Lakes. So how are they gonna get there? There's this uh, series of sanitation and shipping canals that connect the Mississippi River to Lake Michigan. And there is a huge amount of concern right now that these guys are just gonna cruise right up into Lake Michigan and cause serious devastation to the Great Lakes. Um, so the Army Corps of Engineers, who I used to work for, built an electric barrier to try and deter those fish from moving north into the Great Lakes. So the effectiveness of the barrier has been brought into question. There's a lot of litigation and a lot of legal problems going on right now in Chicago. There are some environmental groups that are saying we need to completely physically block these canals so that these guys cannot get in. But of course, there's a lot of economic impacts for that. If you just cut this canal system, then you're gonna have to unload cargo and reload it to ships on the other side of the barrier to keep things moving down the Mississippi. Um, also, there's sanitation concerns. A lot of these canals were actually built for sanitation and uh, stormwater removal and that kind of thing. Um, so these, this is a huge, huge, huge concern right now. How do we keep these things out of the Great Lakes with all of these open access channels running through Chicago? So the electric barrier is one way we're trying to do it. There's intensive monitoring going on, trying to track exactly how far these guys have moved up river. And that's actually one of my specialties is actually environmental DNA. So uh, um, sampling aquatic environments is really difficult. If you go out to the Ohio River and I say, what's living here? It's gonna be really tough for you to tell me, right? You're gonna have to get out there and do some fishing. You're gonna have to get out there and do netting and electrofishing and scuba diving and trying to figure out what's out there because it's really hard to survey an aquatic system. And that's because you have this huge three-dimensional space. The animals you're looking for are moving, unless you're looking at zebra mussels or something that's stationary. And you have poor visibility, you've got water currents. It's very, very difficult to survey aquatic environments. So a lot of scientists thought, there's gotta be an easier way. Maybe we can come up with some cool way to go out and tell what's living in a system, in an aquatic system, 
without actually doing all that stuff. So what we were doing at the Army Corps was doing environmental DNA work. So as all of you are sitting in your chairs, you're shedding hairs and skin cells, you're leaving pieces of yourself behind. So this is just like CSI River or CSI Lake, right? We're looking for traces of DNA that these organisms swimming around in the water column are excreting. So that's what I spent three years with the Army Corps doing. So basically, instead of going out and fishing and netting and electrofishing and sending scuba divers out, what we did was we went out, took a two liter water sample from a boat, went back to the lab, filtered it out, and this is all the stuff that was floating around in the water. And we take that filter and we break it down and pull out all of the DNA that's floating around in that water sample. And we probe for a particular piece of DNA that's specific to the organism that we're interested in finding. It's a needle in a haystack. And I could talk for hours about eDNA. So if anybody wants to know about eDNA, you can talk to me a little later. But um, it's a really crazy high-tech method to sample or survey an aquatic system without actually having to go out and spend all of the man hours and equipment and boating costs to go out and get a good survey sample. So eDNA is kind of a neat trick that we've been trying to develop to see if we can actually do that. So we were using this specifically to look for Asian carp in the Chicago area waterways. And if you're interested in that, there's actually a website dedicated to all that program. So you can check that out. Uh, common wall lizard, Podarchus moralis. This guy, does anyone know the story that this that came out here? Um, so back in the 1950s, a little boy went on vacation with his family to Italy and brought these guys back in his socks, apparently. That's the version I've heard. He released them in his yard, and now they are all over the city. So they found the backyard of this little boy's house to their liking. They reproduced, they established, and they've started to spread throughout the city. So we're not really sure about the problems of these guys. So depending who you ask, some people feel that they are a problem and they're out competing our native lizards. But we're not really sure. Some people don't think they're displacing anything because they're staying in the urban environment. So these guys like the walls that are used in landscaping or along your driveway. So there's some debate about how much of a problem these guys really are, but they are definitely spreading. They're really happy here. They really like it. <clears throat> so what can you do about these guys? Don't move them around. They're spreading just fine on their own. You don't need to move them. And this is another example of don't release pets into the wild, right? So don't release something you've brought from another area or something that you're having as a domestic pet. So some invasions are not quite so obvious invasions. And that's because a lot of these species have been with us for so long that we don't think about them not having been here all along. So these are called naturalized species. So these are species that have been with us for so long, we have really no recollection of when they weren't around or the impacts that they've had. So most of these arrived with European colonists. They've been with us hundreds of years. And a lot of them have been pests. Some of them have been beneficial. It depends who you ask, and I'll talk about a few of those. Um, so a couple of examples, we've got house sparrows. There's a few on the table in the back from our museum collection, if you want to take a look at those. Again, native to Europe and Asia, they were brought over. They're competing with our native birds for resources, food, nest sites. And this is actually the most widely distributed wild bird in the world now because it's been introduced to just about everywhere. And it does really well with humans. So it really likes our human structures, lives off of our trash, off of the, you know, stuff from the drive through that falls out of your car when you're driving through. Um, they're really happy to feed on that kind of stuff. So house sparrows are one of these things that have always been around, but we just don't think of them as invasive anymore. Starlings are kind of the same way. 
they are considered a crop pest and they can get um, damaging in big flocks. Um, they're a major cause of airplane collisions. So if you hear about birds getting sucked into engines of planes, um, sometimes it's large flocks of starlings, not just uh, geese or ducks or bigger water birds. <laughs> Rock dove. I like doves. I know a lot of people don't, but <laughs> they're, I think, really neat. Um, they're considered a pest, of course, in a lot of cities. They, you know, they have droppings that get all over your car, all over your buildings. They like to hang around in the parks and eat people's, you know, lunch scraps and things. Um, but they can also carry disease. So you have to be really careful when you're dealing with pigeons because they can spread disease. Uh, brown rats. These are probably native to China. Um, they compete with our native species for food, and these can be disease vectors also. So mammals are really good at harboring and passing diseases from animals or humans. Um, so they can be worrisome for that regard. They can also cause some structural damage. These guys like to burrow, climb, chew things up. Uh, so that's, an, uh, that's a problem as well. Domestic cats. <coughs> These guys are problematic because they like to prey on birds. Um, I saw a couple of cats out behind the museum the other day chasing wall lizards around. Not sure how I felt about that, an invasive chasing an invasive, but you know, I, I was rooting for the lizards. But um, anyway, so these guys, of course, can transmit disease. We've got things like toxoplasmosis you've probably heard about. This is a big concern for pregnancy. You don't want to get exposed to this. Rabies, and then of course there's a lot of feline specific uh, diseases that can be passed um, among felines. Uh, so what can you do about it? Try to keep your animals contained. Uh, you don't want them exposed to um, feral animals. And you also don't want yours to become a pest for someone else's bird feeders or someone else's uh, children to come in contact with. Um, so you don't want to encourage feral cats to hang around um, or uh, interact with your pets or children. So a couple of potential problems. Um, so this is another species that I study. This is the spotted lanternfly. Has anyone heard about this on the news yet? It's not quite close enough to us to make the news. This is a new invasive that's been discovered right outside of Philadelphia. And it is right now in its establishment phase. It's in that lag time. So it's contained to four counties right now outside of Philadelphia, but they are really dense. So they are everywhere in those four counties. And the concern is they're gonna get to some critical point, some critical density, and they're just gonna start spreading all over the place. So these guys are also sap feeders. So they're a huge agricultural pest. They've been introduced to other regions of the globe and have been a huge problem. USDA is actually giving myself and some of my colleagues money to study these guys and try to figure out where did they come from, how did they get here, and how do we track them when they start to spread. Um, another concern is feral hogs. Um, we don't have them, well we may have them around here. I've had some verbal sightings mentioned to me. Um, but these guys are a really big nuisance and working for the Army Corps for a while, they hate these guys because hogs love to dig and being down in Mississippi for several years, they would dig and undermine the levees and the flood control hillsides that were built along the rivers. So these guys can be hugely destructive. They can cause these clearings and disturbances that Emily talked about that open the pathway for invaders. And they can also cause a lot of damage as far as flood control structures and whatnot. Crops are a big problem. Uh, so these guys may be moving in to the area soon. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is it doesn't go one way, right? We're not the only country on the planet dealing with invasive species. Other countries around the world are receiving North American and South American invaders as well. So some examples, gray squirrels in England, bluegill sunfish in Japan, American bullfrogs in China, prickly pear cacti are getting around all over the place. 
Uh, so those have become a problem in all kinds of places. So there's lots of them that are just moving all around. And it's really difficult to contain these because of our global commerce. People traveling for vacations and things. We have pet trade that's going on globally. So these things really get around. And it's really difficult to track them and to detect them once they arrive in a new location. So we just want to leave you tonight with some information. And these are actually on your handouts, I believe. Uh, <laughs> Emily's going to model these for us. Um, so some local organizations actually host uh, invasive species removal activities. So you can go out and pull honeysuckle or garlic mustard in some of the local parks. We've got Hamilton County Parks, Western Wildlife Corridor, the Wildflower Preservation Society here in town does a lot of these activities. Um, state resources, you have the ODNR, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, the Ohio Invasive Plant Council, and of course Kentucky has a counterpart as well. And, of course, there's nationwide um, resources, USDA, um, USGS, the Fish and Wildlife Service. And if you Google any of the invasive species that we've talked about tonight, you will get page after page after page of information on each species, how to report sightings, how concerned you need to be if you find something in your yard. Oh my gosh, I have a honeysuckle in my yard. Do I, what do I do? Is it okay? Do I leave it? Do I pull it? You can get all kinds of guidance and information on these invasive species online. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about some of the natural history in the area or invasive species, the museum has a few activities coming up. Um, if you're familiar with our, our heritage program, uh, docents at the museum that do a lot of the local history programming, uh, there's a Mill Creek history program coming up. There's also a program on the Fernald Preserve. If you guys are familiar with that, I went there for the first time a few weeks ago. That was a really interesting trip. Um, and then I will actually be giving a joint talk with a member of the Army Corps of Engineers here in town on invasive Ohio River species. Um, and that's coming up in July. So with that, uh, I think I'll call it quits. And if you guys have any additional questions for us, Please let us know. Just check out your stuff. Come on up, Emily. <laughs> With the amount of population, can't these be used as food sources? Oh, yeah, I've missed my little logo up here. So, yeah, one of the slogans of the Asian carp movement is if you can't feed them, eat them. Um, so we are trying to come up with uses for these invasive species. So things like lionfish on the East Coast, people are trying to encourage restaurants to serve them as food. The Asian carp are being used as fertilizer. They're being fished and ground up um, to do fertilizer treatments on plants. Um, and then, of course, we're trying to get people to eat them. The problem with carp is they have sort of a bad reputation as a junk fish. So if you try to get someone to eat carp, they're like, mm, carp, you know? And they're very bony, but they actually taste good. So I've gone to a couple of fisheries conferences, and they've actually served Asian carp, trying to get an interest in people eating these in their diet. So uh, we might have to do something like the, what is it, Patagonia toothfish that they renamed to make it more attractive as a dish. <laughs> um, we might need to do some marketing on the Asian carp. Too. Flying fish. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely, we could, if we could find uses for these, we would definitely benefit. What about the boar? I mean, because you could, these things are considered free range, so is that kind of organic and more appealing um, if it's free range? <laughs> yeah, they're all true, free that's range. True. They're range free. Whatever. Yep, yep. Um, I think with the boars, I think with the wild hogs and things, the, the bigger issue is um, hunting rights and that kind of thing. So you don't want to just go on someone's property and try to kill these boars. Um, they're kind of hard to find, they're hard to trap, they're really smart, <laughs> um, so they're not easy to catch. Um, but we definitely do need to come up with some ways, some creative ways, to eradicate some of these. One of the problems with the boars is a lot of the populations were actually introduced illegally by people who wanted a population to hunt them, um, but they ended up being more of an agricultural pest than benefit for, for food. Uh, a question regarding the wall lizards. Don't they usually populate an area 
and then eventually move away from there, then that area is fine after they're gone? Well, they don't typically leave. They just spread. Um, unless I'm wrong, I don't know, you can <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but as far as I know, they're just spreading. They're not occupying an area and then abandoning it and moving on. I think they that's may, still widespread. And there's, there's especially harsh winters, they can, their populations can crash and they may appear to disappear, but they can come back after they are able to rebuild their population. I'm sorry, I was just thinking. Uh, on the stink bugs, I had heard that it, the, what stinks is like the same thing as for uh, antifreeze, and that that's part of why they can live. Oh, it's because they're on? from someplace in North Korea where it's very, very cold and they can still live through the cold winters. There's a guy who's got a radio show on uh, P500 with the KRC, Gary Sullivan, and he had talked about that, saying that even huh. if you try to freeze them, uh -huh. they, they, they're fine. The only way to really kill them is if you have to put them in a toilet and flush them. <laughs> Okay. So, it's possible. I know a lot of animals do have that type of antifreeze compound in their um, systems so that they can overwinter, but I'm not sure about stink bugs. We'll have to look into that. Any other questions for us? The pumps? Okay. Go yeah. on, we're good. <laughs> I have also heard that um, autumn olive is also an invasive. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. Um, my mother has been killing it lately. Um, <laughs> it's not as well established as most of the ones we talked about, but yeah, that's another one of the top ten in Ohio. And if you go to the, I think it's the Ohio DNR website, they have a list of the top ten invasive plants in Ohio, and it's, it's one of them. Um, I think it's more common in the northern part of Ohio, because when I went through that list, some of them, like Phragmites, it's a huge problem in Ohio, but not here. So autumn olive is one of those where we don't have a huge quantity of it yet, but it's probably there. Well, I help an, uh, an organization in Ross and Highland County, and they are having a terrible problem along oh. the Rock and Fork. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Uh, I hope they're able to take control <laughs> of it. <laughs> Our days are numbered. Uh -oh. <laughs> We're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. I just have a comment about the wall lizard because uh -huh. I really know about it. A friend of mine in high school named George Rao spent his summers in Austria, and he's the one who brought the lizards back, and he let them go on Torrance Court, uh -huh. if you all know where Torrance Court is. And George uh, is very much alive living in Colorado, but his mother was Mrs. Lazarus. Mm -hmm. So many of you know Mrs. Lazarus, and she lived up on Torrance Court, and George is the one who let them go. And he's been written up in the Enquirer. Um, yep. And he did it as a kid. Uh -huh. You know, he just brought him yep. over. Yep. And his father lived in Austria, and that's what he did. Yeah, we actually have a statement from him at the museum oh. explaining <laughs> explaining his, you know, what he did. And um, so, yeah, it's an interesting story. Kids do the darndest things. They do. <laughs> okay. Wow. We have another question. <laughs> We're interested in another one. Oh. oh wow! And there, you can find them roaming around here. Wow. Okay. Oh, I'm gonna have to go hunting. <laughs> go find them. Okay. Okay. I think we have one more question. You know what the best uh, herbicide is for honeysuckle? I personally use glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup. Um, there is another one, I don't think I put it on the slides there, but if you look in those resources, it's something Tricor is another one that's often recommended. But I just use regular old Roundup. It's um, one of the safer herbicides, and you can apply it to the stump, and um, just a few hours before it rains, it's supposedly safe. I try to do it at least a day before it rains, just to be on the safe side, but that's... That would be the one I would personally recommend. Yeah, I use concentrated the concentrated stuff for the stumps. You want to just put it on pure, the concentrated kind. If you do the foliage spray, it could be diluted quite a bit. But, uh, they have directions on the containers for how to use them in the different applications. 
And don't forget we have specimens on the back table. Yes. So we come Why visit us at the back plants. table. Um, I had a quick question. Sure. Um, I know a lot of the nurseries that I've been to in the area tend to sell a lot of the plants that are considered invasive. Is anything being done to deter that? Uh, not really public outreach. So one of the other papers we have is the um, Wild Ones Guide to Non-Native Plants to Avoid. But um, it's not really well regulated. There's not a lot of plants that are regulated. I believe there are a few, but I don't even think, like, even calorie pear, you're still able to purchase and plant. So it's pretty much on the plant buyer to know what they are buying and try to make an informed decision, because there's not much regulation right now for that. OK, I think we have time for one more question. We have one more. Everybody good? OK, well, let's give our speakers here a round of applause. Thank you, Thank you very, very much for coming. You're welcome. I love doing talks. I don't know. That's probably why I talk too long. Yeah, you can eat it. Um, everything I saw implied that it would be cooked.